Okay, so uh, today we're going to be talking about, oops, I might have to edit that video. Uh, was it on the screen? I don't know if it was or not. I'll edit it later. Uh, <laughs> I hate doing that. Okay, so we're going to be talking about chapter 5.1, which is probability rules. Now, for the most part, this is going to be a board discussion, but you can see here, or maybe, yeah, you can see here. If I, hopefully, it was, if it was out of focus, I don't have to worry about that. Um, this is a really cool, about a six minute video or audio thing. It's not a video, it's an audio. Magic or math, the appeal of coincidences and reality. Um, if we have time at the end of the class, I think this might be fun to, um, to talk about, but uh, to listen to it, like I said, it's only about six minutes. Um, really fun. Hidden Brain, I think I've told you that's one of my favorite podcasts. They do a lot of statistics in the Hidden Brain. They talk about a lot of social statistics and kind of things. So it's a lot, a lot of fun. Um, but really quickly, uh, it feels strange when you bump into your childhood friend on the first day of college or meet someone at a party in Paris only to discover she lives in your dad's childhood home in Poughkeepsie, New York. But mathematician Joe Mazur says these coincidences are not as extraordinary as you think. Okay, so it's it's a fun little thing there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about. Yeah, I think it was out of focus here. All right, so we're going to talk about probability. Probability. Okay, it's used to try to predict and outcome. It was first discovered by a mathematician by the name of Blaise Pascal. There used to be a computer language called Pascal. Did any, has anybody ever heard of it? You've heard of it, that's good. I actually learned that in high school. Never used it. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so it's a number between zero and one that describes the proportion of times an outcome occurs. Okay, so we've got three types. Okay, number one is theoretical. Number two is empirical. And number three is personal, my favorite. Okay, we've got a big game coming up on Sunday, right? Who's playing? The Patriots and the Eagles, okay. Who's a football fan in here? It's uh, Tyler, isn't it? Tyler, what's the probability that the Eagles are going to win on Sunday? 98? Oh, point 98. Okay. <laughs> so about a 1% probability. Anybody else have a prognostication on the Eagles winning? I like Tyler's number, by the way. I'm a Patriots fan. Nobody else? Eric, you got something. You don't follow football? Really? What's wrong with you? I know. I'm just too busy studying stats. Okay. Too busy studying stats. Okay. All right. So, Tyler, how did you come up with that number, 0. 0.98? Zero. <laughs> Between zero and one, and it's close to 100% that the Patriots will win. They said that back when the Patriots were, gonna, were undefeated, too, and they, they lost the Giants. I, I was very heartbroken about that. Yeah, so I, I don't want to rematch. I, I hate the Giants, by the way. So, yeah, personal means anything you want, you can make it up, right? Okay. Any Browns fans in here, by chance? Browns were terrible this year, right? We'd like to say, are you a Browns fan? They didn't used to be. Back when they had uh, Marty Schottenheimer, they were pretty good. The Drive, anybody remember The Drive? John Elway? Yeah. Ernest Beiner, anyway. <laughs> 
So the Browns are so bad, we might want to say that it's negative. The probability they win the Super Bowl next year, but we can't go negative, right? It's got to be between zero and one. But yeah, personal can be anything you want. Uh, you can just make it up. Um, okay, let's talk about theoretical. You try to calculate based on rules. Okay. How many people play cards? Franco, what's the probability that I pull a king out of a deck of cards? You said one, but how many kings are there? Oh, four. four. Yeah, I didn't, yeah, so it's four out of 52. That's what you meant, okay? So how did you figure that out? 52 cards in a deck. Four kings, so you're doing this based on rules, right? Um, let's see here. Trevin, if I roll a single die, six-sided die, what's the probability it comes up with a four? One out of six, okay, based on rules, right? Okay, so we're going to focus mainly on theoretical, but we'll also talk about empirical. So empirical is where you measure how often something happens. Okay, so we don't have very many women in here. We'll ask a, um, a female question and a male question. Women, oh, well, there's just four of you. Women, what's the probability that you get breast cancer? Men, what's the probability you get prostate cancer? I actually know the answer to that one. Prostate, it's more than 40%. If, you li if something else doesn't kill you first, like a car accident or a heart attack, your probability of prostate cancer, almost 100%. <laughs> yeah, it sucks. Okay, you're going to get it if you live long enough. If you don't die from a heart attack first, okay, from all that fast food. But but let's talk about the women. Women, how is the probability you get breast cancer? I don't know the I don't know the answer, but how would you figure that out? Okay. Okay, so you you're telling me it depends on a bunch of different factors and that's true. I'm not I'm not minimizing that. That is true. But what I'm saying is you work for an insurance company, somebody wants breast cancer insurance. How do you decide if they're going to get breast cancer? It's 12%? Okay, it's 12%. So how did they get the 12%? How did Google figure that out? I'm sure that was a Google answer, right? Google answer. Cuz Google. So how does Google know that? They just make it up. Is that a personal probability? They just make it up? They counted everybody up and found out how many, what proportion. Okay, so you measure how often something happens. That's exactly what an empirical, prob uh, empirical probability is. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the myth of randomness. Okay. Let's say... I'm still on there, barely. Let's say that I toss a coin six times, and one time I get heads, tails, heads, tails, tails, heads. Another time I get tails, 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 heads, heads, heads. Okay? Out of those two possibilities, who says that option number one is more random? One, two, three, four. Who says that option number two is more random? Is that a one? Who says they're equally likely? Uh, yeah, trick question, huh? Hold up. Yes, they are equally likely. Problem is with humans, we look at that, we go, well, that doesn't look random. So they actually do magic tricks. And the, there's a magician who walk in the room and he'll say, I want you to... Uh, flip a coin, and then he actually, I'm trying to remember how it works exactly, but he looks for the one that has more patterns in it. That's the one that's actually more random. <laughs> okay. 
we think that if it's random, it has to have more variability. It doesn't necessarily. Okay. So, um, in fact, there's a great Mythbusters episode, if we can show it. They want to know if the, um, is that going to focus? Focus? Ah, whatever. Uh, they want to know if the, here, I'll try this. That'll help, right? Maybe it will help. <laughs> if the butter, if the toes lands butter side up or butter side down, and he's like, oh, well, that's way not random. And it's like, well, you don't know, maybe it is. Okay. All right. Um, let's also talk about the law of large numbers. Okay. And what that, okay, the definition that I like to give you, why the casino always wins. Okay, they understand a lot of large numbers. That's not the real definition. <laughs> but I think it's a good one. Okay, so um, basically as the number of repetitions, repetitions increases, the observed gets closer to the theoretical. Okay, so let me do a, a quick example for you very quickly to show you. Okay, let's say that you and I are having a bet. We're betting a dollar on a flip of a coin. Okay, you bet heads. You get three heads, it comes up three heads and seven tails. Okay, pretend I'm the casino. Okay, now how many heads would you expect? You would expect five heads, right? So if you expected five and you only got three, how much are you down? You're down $2. But you're in Las Vegas. What is your thought? What's that? Might as well, it's only 10 bucks, right? And you're only, you're only down two, so yeah, odds, odds are in your favor that it's going to get better, right? You're going to start winning money. Okay, so we do this. We do this 100 times. It comes up, and it's 40 heads, and it's 60 tails. Okay, odds have improved, right? We've improved from 30% heads to 40% heads. How much are you down? You're now down $10. Okay. We're doing this a thousand times. It comes up 450 heads, 550 tails. Odds have improved, right? We've gone from 30% to 40% to 45%. How much are you down? You're now down $50. <laughs> okay, law of large numbers is at work. Yes, it gets closer to the theoretical. And the fact of the matter is, the casino never bets on a coin toss. Well, they do on the Super Bowl, I guess. But <laughs> um, they always put it in their favor. Okay? Law of large numbers, it's, it's in your favor, right? It's getting better in your favor. You're, you're losing more and more money. Okay? It could go the opposite. And that's what Las Vegas wants you to think. This is why gambling is stupid. Um, so they had, they had a bunch of actuaries. Do you guys want to make a lot of money? Okay, become an actuary. Actuaries are employed by insurance companies. They're the people who find out how much to charge you based on your chance to get in a car accident or breast cancer or prostate cancer or whatever, okay? They figure out how much to charge because they always want to make money. <laughs> They're just like here. There was a big uh, convention in Las Vegas, a bunch of actuaries coming to town and, and Las Vegas was like, ooh, I don't know if this is a good idea. They can count cards, they'll, they'll, they'll clean us out. They didn't bet at all. And Las Vegas was like, keep coming back, sure. Just pay for our hotel rooms. As long as you don't bet, we're good, okay? For actuaries are really good at probability. Now probability, 
one of the things that I like to tell people is, um, you know, usually when they hear that I teach statistics, they say, oh, you can help me with my fantasy picks. Who should I pick? Or, you know, my pick, you know, I got 10 games this weekend on the NFL. You're going to help me. The funny thing is, I don't have any inside scoop. I don't use any math. I just go, yeah, I think Dallas is going to win. And I think the Eagles are going to win or whatever. I always come in second place. I never come in first. <laughs> um, just because I like football. But um, at any rate, let's talk about a sample space. I, I much prefer statistics over probability. We're going to teach you enough probability just because you need to know it for, for this. But if you want to make a lot of money, the actuary is really super good at probability. Sample space is a collection of all outcomes. Okay. And an event is a specific set of outcomes. Okay, so for example, I always love to do this on a test because students are too lazy and they don't want to get the right answer. I always write the right answer. I always make out the sample space, okay? Let's say that I wanted to know what's the probability that I roll a four or an 11 on a die, okay? Now some of you, if you play craps a lot, you might know that. I don't know that. Okay, so here's what I do is I write out the sample space. So I write out a 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5, 2, 6, etc. And I will write this out even to this day because I want to get the problem right. Some of you don't care and you think I don't have to do this. Four, five, five, six, and six, one, six, two, six, three, six, four, six, five, and six, six. Okay, so this is my sample space. I've written out all of the possibilities when I roll a pair of dice. Okay, so the probability that I roll a four, well, that could be a three and a one, it could be a two and a two, or it could be a one and a three. The probability that I roll, maybe I'll put an or there, roll an 11 is six and five five and six. How many possibilities are there when I roll two die? There's 36. How many circles do I have? Five. That's the correct answer. Okay. Now at this point, somebody's going to say, but does order really matter? In this case, it doesn't. But well, let me ask you a question. If I just wrote down half of those, okay, so these aren't here anymore, what would you get? Three out of, sorry, I shouldn't have, I should have kept that in there. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Three out of 21. Is that the correct answer? Uh -uh. So if you don't write out all of them, you may get the answer wrong. Okay. Um, let me pull up a quick Excel thing here. We're going to talk a little bit about empirical probabilities. And I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Let's say that the census says we've got marital status. And we've got uh, probability. So this is according to the census. Uh, this is a woman aged 25 to 29, according to the census. I don't know what year. You can pick a year. Uh, so we've got the never married. We've got the married. We've got the widowed. We've got the divorced. Okay, so I've got 0 0.503, 0 0.452, 0 0.003, 0 0.042. And what if I said to find the probability that the person is not married? 
not currently married. How would you find that out, Stainer? Not currently married. Not currently married. Ooh, that would be a bad idea. He, went, he said sum it and divide it by the 4.452. No, don't, I don't want any division. How about you, Jacob? Add up the divorced, the widowed, and the never marrieds. Okay. Now, Jacob, that's that's the correct answer for what I want to do. But let me ask you a question. What did Jacob, Jacob made an assumption there. He assumed that a woman, by the way, the answer is 0.548. He assumed that the woman could not be both simultaneously divorced and married. Right? Could a woman 25 to 29 be both, well, hopefully married, widowed, and divorced at the same time? Call her the black widow, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so we made an assumption that you can only be in one of these categories. So that, that the word that we call that is what is mutually exclusive. Okay, mutually, dis mutually exclusive means only in one category. You're either married or you're divorced or you're widowed, you can't be all three. Now in real life, a woman could, right? Or a man, okay? So we're saying, and another word for mutually exclusive would be disjoint. If I were to draw a little Venn diagram, I'd have the marrieds, the never marrieds, the divorced, and the widowed. They would not overlap at all, okay? Now in real life, they're probably going to overlap a little bit. Um, now, another way to figure this out, okay, is what we call the complement rule. Okay. Sometimes that's easier. The complement rule says the probability of an event equals one minus the probability of not the event. Okay. So rather than adding them up, all three of them, we could have said, oh, the probability that somebody is not married is simply one minus the probability that they are married, 0.452 in this case. Get the same answer, okay? Which one's easier to figure out? Sometimes, yeah, so sometimes the complement rule can be much easier, okay? All right, um, is there a question? All right, so let's talk about independence. Independence, okay. Two phenomena are independent if the probability of one does not affect the probability of the other. Okay, so I flip a coin, I get ahead. I flip a coin a second time. Is the probability of a head more likely or less likely depending on whether I got the first head? They're not related, right? Okay, so that would be an example of independence. Okay, now we'll go back to Franco's problem here because he's a card player. Franco, I pull a king of hearts out of the deck. I put it down. Does the probability that I pull a queen of hearts on the next draw, is that affected by my first king of hearts? Yes. So would that be independent or dependent? That would be dependent, okay? So a lot of the times we refer to independence as memoryless, okay? Flipping a coin, the coin has no memory of what happened before. But with cards, if I'm taking cards out of the deck, they have a memory, right? 
All right. Um, I want to do one really quick. This isn't quick, but I'm going to do this really quickly to talk a little bit about how to handle dependence. We definitely like independence better. It makes the math easy. But let's say that you go to the doctor and he said that you need a kidney transplant. And he tells you that 90% of transplant patients survive surgery. And he tells you by the complement rule, I bet you can figure out what happens with the other 10%. They die. <laughs> okay, the other 10% die. Now he says that 60% of the transplant patients succeed. By the complement rule, 40% have to return to dialysis. And then those that live five years with the new kidney are 70%. And those that live five years with the dialysis are 30%. What is the probability that you live five years? Okay. We're out of time, so I'm going to fly through this a little bit, and we'll be done with 5.1. Now, a tree diagram can be very helpful. Maybe I'll, well, I, don't, I think that it works better if I have the light off. So a tree diagram. Here's how you do a tree diagram. So you're going to have surgery. Surgery. What are the two options? You're either going to live or you're going to die, right? So 90% probability that you live, so 10% probability that you die. If you die, you're not going to live five years. We'll feel bad. We'll come to your funeral, but we won't worry about your probability anymore. <laughs> okay? Now, so that's the first step. The second step is it's going to succeed or it's going to fail. Okay? It's going to succeed 60% of the time. It's going to fail 40% of the time. Fail goes back to dialysis. Yes, we're calling, yeah, calling going back to dialysis a failure. Okay. Now, there's two ways you can get to five years of life. So you're going to live five years or you'll die, or you'll live five or you'll die. Okay. So 70% live five years and 30% die. Oh, you know, I left off some something. Oh, this is actually not true. 50% live five years on dialysis. Now, let me ask you a question. Are these two things independent? They're not independent. Because 70 and 50 adds up to 120. That's greater than 100, right? Okay, so going back to here, you're either going to, it's 70 and 30, and this one's going to be 50 and 50. Okay, there's two ways to live five years. Okay, I can go this route here, 0.9 times 0.6 times 0.7. Somebody figure that out because I didn't write it on my paper. Or I think it's 0.378. Or I could also go this route here. 90%, 40%, 50%. So 0 0.9 times 0.4 times 0.5, that equals 0.18. Now, now that I've got both of these, because these are the two ways I can live, it's 0.558. So the interesting thing is you could live 50% chance you'd live five years on dialysis. You've only improved with your new kidney about 5.8%. Okay, but obviously there's some quality of life issues that are a lot better. All right, so the quiz on Monday is on 5.1. See you all on Monday.